Thank you all for coming and supporting human rights here today. Uh, we have a really great event um, focused on how we as change agents uh, in our professional and personal lives can advocate, not just for ourselves, uh, but for our clients and for communities locally, nationally, and around the world. We're fortunate today to have two great speakers on these issues who I will, who, whom I will introduce in a moment. Um, there will be a few minutes for questions after each of the speakers have concluded their talk. Um, and then we will close our event today by taking action as advocates on behalf of 10 individuals, each of whom is um, in the struggle for their human rights. Without further ado, uh, I want to introduce our first speaker, Todd Schwartz. Todd Schwartz joined Amnesty International at REM concert in 1991 and has served the global human rights organization in several ways. He joined local group 11 in Manhattan the same year that he began to work as a member trainer. He took on the job of area coordinator, a member organizer position that works closely with paid field staff. In 2004, uh, in, in 2004 and supports about a dozen Amnesty local groups in the greater New York City area. He has served on various regional and national committees throughout his tenure and has served on the Amnesty International USA Board of Directors in 2011 to 2012. Todd supports his addiction to activism by working as a medical writer. Please give him a warm Fordham welcome. Well, thank you, Ben. I'm, I'm hoping uh, that I can just speak loudly like this and everyone will hear just fine, that I don't need that and can move around a little bit. Um, big thank you to Ben, uh, as well as uh, all the folks here who uh, helped to make this happen, uh, Marciana and, and uh, Valerie and Bree. Um, but my biggest thank you is to all of you who are here participating in this tonight. And that's for a couple reasons. One, as an activist, any chance that I get to stand in front of folks and talk about the power of activism, uh, both for yourself and for those that you're doing work for, uh, that's a, a blessing to me. It's obviously a, a, a wonderful thing to get to talk about Amnesty International, the organization with which I've been doing this with uh, so much. But more than anything, I'm thankful you're here for these, for these cases that you'll be writing letters on and, and the uh, materials here that'll get handed out later. Um, the work that's done, this letter writing that we do, it really is meaningful and impactful. Uh, and that's actually one of the things that I'll, that I'll wanna talk about, but the main, the main thing that I wanna convey to you today is that you have agency and that means you have responsibility to use it. Um, there are so many people around this world who don't have the kind of agency that we have in this room. People, probably, probably 100 million people around the world who because they're in uh, jail for their beliefs or have a death penalty over their head or are part of a group that either believes or is identified in a certain way, have essentially no agency. We have that agency. And so your agency today starts with a letter. That's going to be, uh, that's going to be my argument. So to do that, I want to tell you a little bit about my story, how I've come to activism and why it means so much to me, to talk about Amnesty's story and how we use our agency to bring about change. And um, also to, uh, um, to talk about how we know that all of this matters, how we know that it actually does make a difference, that it's impactful. Um, and so just briefly, uh, I'll give you sort of uh, a little bit uh, of my uh, resume that's already kind of been given to you a little bit. I'm Todd Schwartz. I work for Amnesty International, um, which doesn't mean that I get paid by Amnesty International. Amnesty has about 100 paid staff members, uh, and it has about 200,000 members. And it has a couple hundred folks like me who share some skill set, some experience set, uh, and offer leadership in other ways. Uh, so uh, uh, for me, that's uh, through training. I've been a trainer for Amnesty International for 20 years and an organizer for about 15. But my resume is not the important thing. My story, hopefully, is, is what will be uh, more informative. I was a teenager. Uh, in the 1980s. I was in high school. I was really interested in ecology. 
um, and really interested in the environmental movement the, 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 uh, and uh, doing environmental activism uh, work. Um, it was the time of the greenhouse effect, right? This rudimentary understanding we had of what we now understand much more holistically as global climate change. It was the time of acid rain and uh, uh, ozone hole and pollution on lands that needed to be cleaned up uh, through Superfund sites. It was also the time of horrific environmental events, events that killed animals in unbelievable numbers, despoiled land, making it uninhabitable, and in some cases killing many people. I think of the Exxon uh, Valdez oil spill and the Chernobyl disaster and uh, obviously the, the Bhopal gas release disaster. These events were just so huge and these issues were just so huge and the perpetrators, I'm going to use that word, the perpetrators were businesses and governments that were just so huge and it felt so powerless. It's, it was hard to imagine how we could hold them accountable. And when you add to that, uh, my sensibility, which I could have been right or wrong about, but my sensibility at the time that, the, that environmental change was really going to happen when uh, entrepreneurs were able to figure out innovative ways to, to provide uh, uh, services in more environmentally friendly ways, to do cleanup and energy efficiency and all that kind of stuff. And so I just felt powerless, passionate and powerless. At the same time, Internas Amnesty International is going out with a series of concerts around the United States and around the world with artists like Peter Gabriel and Tracy Chapman and Sting and Yasu Endur and you 2 all these artists that were the artists of a generation for me, the folks that we listen to nonstop on our radios, actual radios, right? And they were out on these tours and they were telling the stories of human rights violations, of people who were facing these horrific human rights violations, telling those stories to people like me who, who didn't know those stories, who didn't know what was going on all around the world. And what they did was they offered a model by which we had power. Their idea was, our idea is, that we can use our agency for people whose agency is being denied, as we've talked about a little bit before. That we as individuals, whether we're students or teachers or librarians or clerks in a store or plumbers, we can use our voice and raise those voices up for people who cannot raise up their own voices on behalf of their own needs, their own interests, and their own rights. And that felt empowering to someone who wanted to be an activist and who was feeling a sense of powerlessness. That model is what really tied me to Amnesty International. And so Amnesty International started in, in 1961. It started with a newspaper article in the London Examiner uh, newspaper that was called The Forgotten Prisoner. And what it was was starting a one-year campaign for Amnesty on behalf of six individuals. So the article did not provide statistics on the lack of health care in rural Angola, but it did tell the story of Dr. Agostino Neto, an Angolan doctor who was raising those issues within his country and who was tortured and jailed for having done so. It didn't offer an argument for why students in Romania uh, should have the right to, to go to take their ideas, their education, wherever that education took them. Instead, it told the story of the, con of the philosopher Constantine Noitza, who was uh, jailed for teaching banned ideas. It didn't go into the statistics in the American South of civil rights protesters who were uh, beaten or jailed or killed by white mobs and white police officers. But it did tell the story of Reverend Ashton Jones, one of those protesters who was beaten 
and who was jailed. It didn't provide an argument for the, the, uh, the importance of collective bargaining rights in Greece, but it told the story of Tony Ambatielos, a, a Greek trade unionist leader. You, you get the idea. It told these stories. It didn't make human rights arguments, but it told stories that could bring in people into activism because of their empathy for what people we're facing. And that's what Amnesty has been doing ever since. Amnesty, uh, uh, one of the core kinds of actions we do is called urgent actions. Those are actions that can go out within a day or two, sometimes less than a day. Go out to activists like me who immediately write email uh, messages or send letters or send faxes to tell a government, we know what you've done. We're aware of this individual, the work they do, and it's wrong. Protect that person. Protect them from disappearance or potential uh, uh, um, summary execution or from whatever the threat is that it is they face. Another big way that we take action is, is through our case files. So once someone has gone through a judicial process that maybe is markedly unfair, we may take on the case and, and uh, tell that person's story to our family members and our friends and our neighbors, our colleagues, our fellow students, to bring them into the activism. Oftentimes, for many months or years or a decade or more, and oftentimes these people are what we call prisoners of conscience, people who have been jailed because they're freely expressing their uh, their, their identity or their beliefs. Another kind of uh, work, uh, uh, element of our work are the research reports that we do where we do get into facts and statistics about human rights violations. But even in those reports, we're telling individual stories of people who are being affected by them. Again, to help bring people into the stories and into the work. One other thing that we do to draw people into the work, to tell these stories, is Right for Rights. We share these stories. Ben, as a member of the organization, brings these stories uh, to, to all of you to share these stories, to encourage you to take action, to encourage you to step forward and to use your voice uh, for human rights. So the obvious question is, how do we know that any of this actually makes a difference? That any of this actually works to bring about any kind of change whatsoever? Well, let's start off just talking about does amnesty make a difference? Since 1961, there have been 42,000 cases that amnesty has taken up put out actions like these that you see in front of you to activists like us in which the individual being focused on has had um, some major improvement in their case situation. Maybe that's deferral of a death sentence. Maybe that's their release. Maybe that's an opportunity to have their case tried again if they face an unfair trial. Maybe that's investigation into the people who mistreated or tortured them while they were collecting evidence. 42,000 cases. Now, we know we don't get to claim credit for all of that, obviously. We work in partnership with organizations around the world, around the country, around the New York City area. We're all working together on this. But we do know that amnesty makes a difference. We have lots and lots of, of quotes from prisoners who tell us that. One of them is uh, Julio uh, de Peña Valdez, a trade union leader from the Dominican Republic. It's one of the most famous quotes we use, but in talking about amnesty, he said, when the first 200 letters came, the guards gave me back my clothes. I'm sorry, I always get emotional when I read this. Then the next 200 letters came, and the prison director came to see me. When the next pile of letters arrived, the director got in touch with his superior. The letters kept coming and coming, 3,000 of them. 
The president was informed. The letters still kept arriving and the president called the prison and told them to let me go. The work that we do matters. Even if it only matters to the individual, it matters. It makes a huge difference in people's lives. How do we know that Rights for Rights works? Well, instead of going into those stories, I'll just send you to the Amnesty USA website where there are 14 stories in the, on the Right for Rights page under success stories that you can read, stories about how these sheets in prior years and the work done by folks like you have led to major improvements, releases in so many cases of people who, are, who have been standing up for their own rights and being uh, mistreated and arrested for doing so. You can also go to the global website, which has cases from 2010 to 2019 um, that it highlights in each of those years, cases like these um, where there have been releases. But I also just want to talk a little bit about the group work that groups uh, uh, like the group that I'm a member of and that Ben's a member of have done and how we know that matters. Group 11, my group took on the case of U Win Tin. He's a journalist in Myanmar, the country formerly known as Burma. He was in jail for 17 years. He was a journalist. He was in jail for 17 years, some of those in a prison cell that was one meter by one meter by one meter, not big enough to simply stretch his legs. When he was released, he uh, knew, he was informed that we had a fundraising concert for our local group that had been working on his case. He recorded a message for us, for our concert, to tell our members, thank you for the work that you do. Keep it up. Keep doing it. It matters. Another prisoner that our group worked on, Ahmad Batebi, was a uh, a student in Iran in 1999 when there was a major upri uprising at Tehran University. He wasn't one of the lead organizers. He was just one of the students in the crowd with his friends using his voice at great risk. He was standing in a, in a line near the front and the, the, the student, his fellow student immediately to his right was shot and fell. He and his friends took him back to get him medical care. And Ahmad took the, the white, bloodied T-shirt from his body and took it back up to the front lines to show, held it high above his head to show his fellow students, this is the danger we face. This is how bad it is. A photograph was taken of him, and that photograph ended up on the cover of The Economist magazine. When that happened, the Iranian government pledged to find him and to kill him. Amnesty took action as soon as he would arrest it. Our group and other groups worked on the case. And in 2008, late in 2008, he was uh, granted medical parole by the Iranian government, was able to escape the country. And we had uh, the first public event with him here in the United States. That night, a group of about 10 of us from the group were able to go out and have dinner with him, to break bread with the person on whose behalf we'd been working for for so many years. And he told us about the importance of our work, the importance of continuing to do what we do, that it makes a difference. And even the simple fact that he was given a medical release is an example of how the work makes a difference. His wasn't the first case in which he was given a medical release, but somebody was. And whoever it was that was given a medical release that first time because of the letters that came in, the letters that we're writing tonight, gave the government a, a, a different way to approach what it was doing, certainly not for every prisoner, but, but when we do this work, when we raise our voices, when we exert this pressure and use our agency, eventually the government in some cases cracks and says, you know, it's easier to have this person out and maybe they'll escape the country. 
maybe they'll do whatever they do here and we'll have to rearrest them. But it's easier to have them out than to deal with this constant pressure that we're getting from people all over the world. And when I say all over the world, it's worth just mentioning that this Right for Rights event will happen led by people in 170 countries around the world. You're in global solidarity tonight with people from 170 countries around the world focusing on these 10 cases. The point is, your agency starts here with a letter. Now, it's up to you where you take that, which is not pressure, it's just reality. You could, you could uh, form an amnesty group, you could join an amnesty group in your community, you're busy as a student right now, maybe you can't do that, but maybe you'll do that when you graduate. You could join another organization that you're passionate about, maybe that focuses more specifically on a smaller issue rather than all of human rights, but focuses on some specific thing that you're really passionate about. Maybe you'll lobby your government officials and tell them about the, the importance of some issue to you that our government is dealing with, or join a partner organization. Whatever it is, remember that you have agency and the, the, the impact that you have through this agency starts with a letter. Thank you. What, what uh, sort of activism tactics uh, I've, do I find most interesting or, or issues? I think the most impactful is that it, I have all of them that amnesty. So I, one way to answer that is um, to say that, um, is to mention that there's a packet of letters here today. And I'm, I'll start out talking about letters, certainly. Um, there's a packet of letters here today. And one of the things that we know is that these add up. But when you actually set these to the side and take a blank sheet of paper and put your own words mm -hmm. to paper, that um, those are, are even more impactful, that those are read with an understanding that someone has taken the time to really say their own thing. And one of the other things you'll note, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what's in the packet, but on each one of these sheets, or at least many of these mm -hmm. sheets, there's an, um, a solidarity action of sorts, an opportunity for you to actually write to the individual who's facing um, this uh, uh, whatever form of, of oppression that they're facing, or perhaps an organization or a family member that they're connected to. And I always like to point that out because that kind of activism is a twofer because you are both encouraging that individual in their work and in, in knowing that they are in global solidarity, but you can bet that the government is also fully aware of every one of those letters that get sent, and it's every bit as impactful as, as one of these letters. So these solidarity actions and any, any opportunity that we actually have to be in solidarity with and not just work on behalf of or for someone is, is powerful um, because the work is powerful, but it's also powerful for us uh, to have that experience, um, to be supportive in that way. Um, I, I don't know if I can, can, um, can answer with uh, something other than the letter writing from my perspective. And the reason for that is, is that as, a, as an organizer with Amnesty, um, I'm a little less close to the ground tactically. I'm not generally terribly involved in a, in a lot of direct sort of tactical uh, sort of work. But I can tell you that, um, you know, the approaches that we try to take involve, we, we would call these directed actions, um, where we're telling a target um, official about what we want um, to happen. We also use um, a, uh, the legislative action, the, the lobbying kind of action, and some other uh, tools with our government connections. We also do the publicity work, which can be placing publicity in the forms of trying to, to write letters to the editor and things like that, but also the events that we have, the, the big public kinds of events, demonstrations and vigils and things like that, where we try to attract um, uh, 
attention from media, um, as well as working with partner organizations. So part of the, the, the tactical toolkit is to not really look at a single tactic and focus solely on a single tactic, but to try to actually use different tactics in the toolkit um, and to recognize that when we can do that in a way where one tactic leads to the next tactic, leads to the next tactic, so that, so that it's building momentum and you're approaching it strategically, you, that's where you really can maximize your effect, effectiveness. Not to say one tactic can't be impactful, it can. But when you can think strategically about how to move from one to the next to the next to the next, that's how you build momentum. And that's how an organization like Amnesty goes from four people at its first uh, protest around the, the potential execution of Troy Davis to being on nonstop news the night of Troy Davis's execution, which sadly we didn't prevent, but we building momentum, building momentum, telling the story by that kind of tactical um, uh, variety. I hope that's helpful. Sure, so um, we have chapters that are both uh, student chapters and um, uh, local chapters, they're community chapters. And um, uh, both are, are valuable import and important, and both do things a little bit differently. Student chapters um, have students that are rotating you know, through the school uh, and, and may spend four years at a typical undergraduate education in a graduate setting. It might be you know, substantially shorter than that. Um, and so our student groups are often um, focused on high profile campaigns that Amnesty is, is doing. Uh, around high profile issues. And our local groups tend to uh, take on more long term things because they, the local groups often go on for, for decades worth of time. Um, and really all you need to do is, is uh, um, con you can connect with me, you can connect with uh, uh, some of uh, my colleagues, we can get you the information. It's about finding steady leadership having a place to be able to meet, um, committing to being able to get resources. Some schools can help uh, underwrite the expenses of groups. Some uh, student groups need to do a substantial fundraising to underwrite the expenses that are involved in you know, sending all of these envelopes that you see in front of you, which uh, takes some money. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, uh, if there's interest, we can, we can make it happen. Uh, there's both paid staff and volunteer folks like myself who are involved in helping groups get started, figure out what they want to do and how they want to try to create a sustainable, uh, sustainable group. Yeah, so we, um, we're uh, based out of New York City. There's an office uh, right around Penn, uh, Penn Station. Um, it's actually not the, the biggest office that we have. Our DC is actually our biggest office uh, now these days, but we're headquartered in New York um, uh, and therefore have to follow New York state laws and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we have um, offices in, uh, I'm actually not exactly sure, about a half dozen um, uh, cities where there are our offices with at least a couple of people working. And then there are organizers who are paid organizers who are working out of their homes, uh, you know, in, in other areas. Um, but yeah, New York has, has an office. Um, and uh, I, I don't know whether this is the reason you, you, you might be interested in this. Um, we've, we, um, a few years ago, we were overusing and not appropriately uh, compensating uh, our interns. And we, we recognized that, uh, thanks to our interns' activism. <laughs> and um, so we don't have a ton of internships anymore because we've committed to making sure that if you're going to intern with Amnesty International, you're going to get treated right. Um, uh, nonetheless, if there's interest in possibly interning with, uh, with Amnesty, I can be sure to uh, forward. Uh, that information. Mm -hmm. Get that to the right as people's as hands. As an intern, I appreciate <laughs> 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 There aren't as many opportunities, but they're better. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. Say so thank. Let's have another warm up. Thank you, um, Todd, for really um, 
hitting on the, the, the work of individual work and, and how important it is, um, and uh, the, the work of letter writing and how uh, impactful that is. It's, it's really extraordinary. Um, in, uh, and as you sort of discussed, um, one of the other uh, elements of Amnesty's work is working uh, with local um, uh, legislative leaders, um, state, local, uh, and national. Um, and uh, one of the bills that uh, Amnesty has been working on for a, a little bit of time now is an immigrant um, detention center uh, rights bill. Um, so um, our next speaker, um, Sumit Sharma, who currently serves as the Chief of Staff to New York State Assembly men, uh, member David Weprin, who represents the state's 24th uh, Assembly District in Queens and chairs the Assembly Committee on Correction. Uh, prior to serving in his current role, Sumit was the Director of Legislative Affairs as well as the Director of Communications for Assemblymember Weprin. In his time working uh, in the state legislature, Sumit has been instrumental in campaigns that have resulted in the prohibition of discrimination and employment based on religious attire, the restoration of rights for adult adoptees, the establishment of disability benefits for civilians involved in the World Trade Center cleanup, and the establishment of the right to allowing legislative staff to visit correctional facilities for oversight purposes. Um, Sumit has volunteered as a judge for the American Debate League, an instructor for Rikers Debate Project and in school, participated as a debater on the University of Vermont and Bronx High School of Science debate teams. He's also a fan of the New York Knicks, long road trips, and his home borough of Queens. Without further Everyone. Um, thank you, Ben, for uh, that kind introduction. Um, and um, uh, also, thank you to uh, Professors Curcio and um, Popescu for their work in support of a rainy though. But I um, also would like to thank, thank Todd, but um, I don't know if I will be as inspirational um, and uh, impactful um, as he was. He also uh, uh, took the next thing I was going to say, which is I'd like to thank everyone here, mm -hmm. uh, specifically uh, who is here for the Right for Rights campaign. Um, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a weeknight, um, it's, you know, after, you know, in the evening, and uh, I just know from my experience working in the legislature and just, you know, seeing things, events in the media, watching the news, uh, that it's really difficult to effectuate change and to get people together. So, um, you know, just the fact that we have a group of people here tonight, uh, you know, speaks to, uh, I guess as Todd said, the agency that we could have individually um, and together. So, um, you know, it's really nice um, to see everyone here tonight. So thank you again. And just to reiterate what Todd said, um, I'd just like to sort of repeat that. Um, I know that um, my boss, Assemblyman David Weprin, uh, was originally invited to speak here tonight, um, but uh, was unable to do so because he was called up to Albany for some legislative conference that they have, um, and um, he's up there for all this week. Um, so I'm here, um, and I wrote down over here that, um, you know, I, um, although I appreciate, you know, working for Assemblyman Weprin and his advocacy and passion for these types of issues, um, I was, uh, with some guilt, uh, glad that he wasn't able to make the event tonight uh, because um, uh, it gave me the chance to share my thoughts on an issue that's both close to me and as a legislative staffer who is on uh, the receiving end of a lot of uh, letter writing campaigns, phone calls, things like that, um, on a number of different issues. Um, also, I think that um, um, he, uh, it, sort of, I, I appreciate the agency part because um, these are these, you know, large issues, and uh, some of them seem impossible to create any change on. And you know, why would a state legislative office sort of be here for this, you know, big right for rights campaign or a representative from a state legislative office? And I think that connects well to agency too, because you know, perhaps you know, he's not a representative on the federal level. He's not a congressperson. You know, there's uh, someone in Washington in leadership who is not aligned with his views at all. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't create some sort of uh, campaign or some sort of change or some sort of movement towards change on the state level too. Um, so um, 
I think that's what we are trying to do. And, uh, you know, I'd be really glad to share the story of um, how this bell uh, that Ben mentioned came to, uh, you know, came to our office, uh, sort of the work we've been doing uh, to lead to Amnesty connecting uh, with our office, um, as well as, I think, um, what we need to do uh, moving forward. Um, and hopefully all that could relate to uh, perhaps a real world example on, um, on local change uh, that we can make uh, that could translate into uh, you know, global change on these larger campaigns and even on the local and state level. Um, so um, thanks again to everyone here. And uh, I guess um, I'll get started. Um, so the, uh, the legislation uh, that, we, um, that we introduced uh, in New York State is called the Immigration Detention and Oversight Act. Um, it's a bill um, that our office worked with Amnesty International through beginning in 2018 and through 2019 um, that does a few different things. I'll go over it quickly just so we don't get into the weeds for too long, but there's an understanding. Um, so first, um, it prohibits local governments uh, to use funds or resources for the construction or expansion of immigration detention facilities in New York State um, unless they gain approval from the legislature and the governor, uh, which is all currently controlled by Democrats, by the way. Uh, second, it prohibits the use of public lands uh, for the construction or buildings for the construction of new, any new federal or private detention facilities by the state or local governments. Um, it limits those governments from expanding upon and entering into new agreements uh, to detain non-citizens um, unless they get approval from, again, the New York State Legislature and the Governor, and it creates a commission uh, to create oversight uh, to visit the current uh, detention facilities in New York State, um, so to ensure that they're in compliance with both federal um, and state law. Um, so, in short, uh, we hope the passage of this bill will stop ICE, uh, along with private prison contractors, from contracting with counties in the state to house immigration detainees um, and other private prison uh, uh, and private prisons uh, completely. Private prisons, by the way, are completely uh, are, are not legal in New York State. Um, so uh, that is something that, as a state, we're fortunate with. We don't have to uh, confront as much, but we figured we should put it in this bill draft um, just in case. Um, it does happen in the future. Um, and uh, although this bill wouldn't completely remove ICE out of the state since they could still operate on federal lands and in federal agencies, it gives us a chance to use our agency as a state government office uh, to ensure that ICE is in compliance when they are and to sort of build pressure on them uh, in the long run. Um, a couple of things I'm hoping that will come out of this is it would restrict ICE's ability to detain individuals in New York it would restrict the amount of available beds they have uh, nationwide. Um, it would allow the state to intervene in different cases where detainees are not being held in humane conditions. And finally, and I think this is sort of the, the crux of the issue, it's uh, we want to stop local governments from building new jails in hopes of uh, having a new contract with a private, uh, with a private prison company um, or immigration and customs. So what we saw um, was that you have local governments, uh, you know, where perhaps uh, all the elected officials are of, you know, one political persuasion entering into contracts with um, the federal government uh, for the housing of immigration detainees, um, which gives, uh, is, is a great funding stream uh, for these local governments. Um, and that's not a way that they should be receiving their funding, uh, frankly, uh, by detaining people. So. Um, um, so that was uh, the thinking behind this bill. Um, all that seems straightforward enough, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, uh, we know what we want. Our office is on the same side. Democratic legislature, Democratic governor. Um, okay, so you know uh, we have advocates, Amnesty International, supportive of the bill. They sent us the bill draft. You know we worked off of that. So what do we do? Um, how did this sort of come to happen? You know, how did Amnesty reach out to our office, how that connection happened, and uh, how, what, what I think we should do moving forward um, to, you know, get this bill to pass, I suppose. Um, so I'll start with uh, how it happened. Um, 
on a fall day in 2018. That's what I wrote down over here. Uh, my boss, Mr. Weber, um, after hearing some news about indefinite detentions, and uh, probably after seeing Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon visit an uh, uh, immigration facility um, on the southern border around that time, uh, came up to a couple of us in the office and asked if he thought we could visit uh, immigration detainees in New York. Um, you might think that this came out of the blow uh, from him seeing a news story, uh, but he did have some sort of uh, jurisdiction over this since he's the chair, as uh, Ben mentioned, uh, of the Assembly Committee on Correction, which oversight, which oversees, which has oversight over the jails and prisons in New York State. So he'd been visiting uh, different uh, state prison facilities um, since he's had the chairmanship, which I think is three years now. Um, um, he has oversight. Um, he also um, represents um, a district in Queens, um, which is where I work uh, when the legislature is out of session. Um, and it's actually one of the most uh, ethnically and racially uh, diverse districts in the state. Um, something um, that we noticed beginning in 2016 um, is um, uh, a lot of people um, in Queens contacting our office, uh, people in immigrant communities contacting our office um, about um, unfair and unjust um, detentions um, of people who were living in Queens um, or living in other parts of the city. Um, you know, uh, sadly, um, the more we got involved in this issue, the more we started hearing about it from different people across the country and across the state. So these unfair, unjust detentions are happening really nationwide. Um, it's happening in upstate New York. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's affecting a lot of people. Um, and um, it's, uh, you know, in a sense, um, I was just listening to Tuck speak earlier, and, uh, you know, it, uh, effectuating change. You hear about, you know, a lot of Amnesty's work and a lot of Amnesty's international work is international. Um, and, um, and, you know, it, it, it's troubling uh, that um, it's happening in our own state. Um, and um, and uh, on the plus side, that gives us that much more agency and puts us in a that much more position of responsibility uh, to act um, because we're voters in the state. You know, we have not only do we have the traditional agency, but we are entrusted with certain rights and privileges um, to take advantage of. Um, so anyway, going back to uh, the story. So my uh, assembly in Weprin, uh wanted to go to a, a, a county jail uh, to visit, and um, um, we were sort of unsure how this would effectuate change. We're on the state level. This is a federal issue, uh, but we felt like it's something we had to do. Um, so we went in September 2018 to the Albany County Jail, um, and um, we met with uh, immigration detainees, but the first surprising thing we heard uh, came from the staff of, uh, of uh, Sheriff uh, Eli Apple, who's the sheriff up in Albany County. Um, they uh, agreed with us and on our position upon us entering. Um, they didn't understand why Immigration and Customs were sending these uh, individuals to their jail. Did not understand uh, what they had done wrong to be in detention in their jail, as most of them had no records of committing crimes and were value members uh, of their families and communities. Um, and uh, they did not understand why their facility was being used when the immigration court was five hours away in Batavia, New York, uh, for the cases being for the detainees being held at the Albany County Jail. Um, uh, they were sort of flabbergasted. Um, the sheriff of the jail, Sheriff Apple, um, has since then and publicly stated his opposition to uh, Immigration and Customs current enforcement practices, which is a step in the right direction. Um, but, um, um, but, yeah, um, so that was the first thing we saw. Uh, then when we entered the facility, we were approached by uh, hundreds of people. Um, um, the men and women were detained in separate areas, but um, they're allowed. It's, it's, uh, it felt like walking onto, um, you know, a bus anywhere in New York State, um, and uh, you know, or a subway car in you know, downtown, and it's it's it's, it's people. Um, it's the same people, um, and uh, 
And uh, so I wrote down, I guess, a couple of the stories we heard. Um, one person told us he worked as a delivery driver. He delivered to an army base regularly. Um, he was arrested on his last visit to the base uh, because someone from the base called, uh, looked up his uh, immigration status, and then called Immigration and Customs. Uh, he did not understand why, after not being a threat for so many years and safely delivering things to a federal facility, that he was considered a threat now. Uh, and, um, uh, another person uh, came to us. Um, he was not an uh, English speaker, um, and he needed uh, someone to translate for us, which another uh, detainee, another person in the prison, um, did in the jail, did, did for us. Um, and, uh, you know, he took that time um, while translated uh, to not tell us about his case. And, you know, I think that it's like a rare opportunity that elected officials in a jail listening to people's stories, and uh, that person took that opportunity to tell us about uh, someone who was in a cell upstairs uh, whose native language was Khmer because he was from Cambodia and did not have access to a translator and as a result hadn't had any legal assistance or access to those proceedings due to this lack of access. Um, this person took that chance to speak to us to tell us about someone who was in a worse situation. I just want to like make that clear. He used his agency in that moment. Um, and then finally, um, we spoke with uh, someone who um, received an order of deportation. Uh, it had been weeks uh, prior to us being there, but was still in detention with no court date, uh, despite having an order uh, to leave the country um, and no sort of uh, communication as to when a court date would be. Um, so we turned to the jail officials. Um, I turned to them, and I asked why uh, these people are still being held. And uh, they said, um, and this was disappointing to hear at the time, but I think looking back to give them some credit, uh, they said they didn't know. Um, and I think that's a surreal moment, right? Like here we are, New York State, and uh, we've reached sort of this crossroads, like a moral crossroads, a ethical crossroads, when you're in a jail, and the jailers who are jailing the people don't know why they're jailing the people in their own jail, right? It's just like, we'll close the door and forget about it. Um, so that happened. Um, we left. Uh, the next month, we visited another jail, uh, this one with a less sympathetic sheriff um, who um, had a uh, new facility uh, built by the county. Uh, the county was Orange County, right you know, across the river. Um, and uh, they have a lucrative contract with ICE uh, where they get paid. I forget what the exact amount is. Albany has a similar contract, uh, but they get paid about uh, more than $100 a day uh, per detainee um, at these facilities. Um, so uh, we called uh, to tell them we'd be visiting, uh, which we do not have to do. Um, and uh, the deputy sheriff uh, who works under Sheriff uh, Carl Dubois, um, said that uh, you're not coming if we don't open the doors. Um, which led to, if you don't, you'll be in prohibition of Section 500J of the Correction Law, a little known section uh, that grants legislators access to correctional facilities in New York. Um, so we went, uh, anyway, uh, Assemblyman Weprin bought a couple of his colleagues on the Correction Committee, Assemblywoman uh, De La Rosa and Assemblywoman uh, Nelly Razek, uh, uh, Assemblywoman Carmen De La Rosa and Assemblywoman uh, Nelly Razek, who are also on the committee uh, and passionate advocates of criminal justice reform overall. Um, and, uh, and our Albany staff and uh, those members staff and a few of us. Um, and they let um, Assemblyman Weprin, uh, Assemblywoman Razek, and Assemblywoman De La Rosa into the facility and they made all the staff wait in a room uh, with the guard outside. And they told us uh, that uh, the law did not cover staff members, so we would be disallowed from entering. Um, so I don't have a first-hand account of that visit, um, but I'll read the statement issued by my, by my boss the following day. So he said, I was quite disturbed by my visit to our Orange County Correctional Facility in Goshen, New York, yesterday. 
Tuesday, November 20th, where my colleagues, Assemblywoman Carmen De La Rosa, Assemblywoman Naila Razik, and I met with several ICE detainees being held at the gym. It became clear as we toured the facility that individuals being held on immigration charges were being treated the same as inmates in general confinement, being housed in cells with mandatory lockdown periods, and being forced to wear prison uniforms rather than regular clothing. A number of individuals noted a lack of heat, less than adequate clothing for confinement, a high cost of phone calls, up to a dollar a minute, a lack of care and medical appointments, and disappointment with the quality of food. Even more troubling was to hear that many of these individuals were being denied due process, held indefinitely for weeks, months, or even years, while waiting for immigration court hearings and court dates. The Department of Homeland Security, Immigration and Customs Enforcement has no justification or reason to be holding nonviolent individuals who came to our country seeking a better life in county jails for indefinite lengths, and the Orange County Correctional Facility has no justification for treating these individuals as violent offenders, especially as the facility receives $133.90 per day for each detainee. Based on what we saw, at best, Trump's DHS ICE is incredibly incompetent, unable to process asylum applications despite record lows in the amount of applications filed, and at worst, deliberately violating human rights as part of an abhorrent policy that seeks to deter asylum seekers and other immigrants by subjecting arrivals to inhumane treatment, inhumane treatment upon surrender. Either way, it's time to end this inhumane, unconstitutional, and possibly illegal policy, and he is once again, since he did this after the Albany visit, uh, calling on immigration and customs enforcement to end the indefinite detentions of immigrants being held on nonviolent misdemeanors, as well as expedited hearings for asylum seekers and others seeking resolutions to their immigration cases. Um, so we have issued the statement, and we have no jurisdiction over federal immigration detainees. Uh, so what do we do, right? Um, luckily, uh, for not allowing the staff in, uh, my boss agreed to put this bill in, and. Um, uh, we changed the law to allow legislative staff into these facilities in the future, and that bill was actually signed by the governor last month. So uh, we could do that, but uh, but um, but you know that really doesn't do anything. So uh, or doesn't go far. So on the issue, but um, after um, um, that's when we sort of heard from the right people, right? We heard from Sheetal Durr and Nita Tika, who work uh, as part of Amnesty International's crisis and response team. Um, they told us about a state-level campaign, uh, which was uh, that to provide more oversight over immigration and customs facilities, um, immigration facilities, and, uh, and, uh, and, and to uh, limit uh, local governments from entering into these contracts uh, with immigration and customs. Um, since there were limited steps that could be made on the federal government on the federal level because of the current administration, I think uh, they thought, um, and it was supported by Amnesty, uh, a state level campaign might help to build pressure and bring some attention uh, to an issue um, that wasn't getting the type of attention, or wasn't possible to get the type of attention on the federal level because of the political situation right now. Uh, so we seized on the idea. Um, it's sort of what we needed. Um, we, um, uh, we went back and forth, worked together uh, with Anita and Cheadle um, on a bill draft, um, you know, worked with our assembly council, uh, got a bill draft together. Um, I spoke to the local senator in the district right over, or his staff uh, in the district right over. Um, in Queens, Senator John Liu, who agreed to carry the bill um, in the Senate. Uh, so we had a Senate sponsor, we had an assembly sponsor. Um, and then it got towards the end of session, which is in May, June in New York. Um, and it uh, did not make it to the finish line, um, which is fine because um, there's a lot of bells um, and a lot of different issues um, that the legislature needs to look at. Um, and I guess this is a good segue into why individual agency matters so much on any topic. Um, so for our office, this was something important to us because of Assemblyman Weapons District and Assemblyman and his correction committee. So we have a real sort of niche over here, 
Um, um, but, um, and this bill wouldn't have come in unless we heard from people in the district that this was important. Uh, but moving forward, um, this bill is not going to pass unless other legislators hear about this bill and directly from uh, involved groups and constituents. So we're going to try to do our work, um, you know, uh, to have press conferences, you know, visit the facilities, do what we need to, um, to try to get uh, this bill. Um, on the plus side, we did hear, I mean, support from some legislators, and it has, I think, around 20 co-sponsors right now, and a good amount of support. So hopefully, it will move uh, early next year. Um, but um, but um, just calls, emails, uh, meetings, uh, running into um, other people locally, uh, these are all things uh, that sort of help uh, and matter. And, um, and um, I wrote over here um, that like in an office, I think legislators look at volume and passion uh, to determine whether they should take action on an issue. And I think there's a miscalculation a lot of times, or a miscommunication, or perhaps I'm just being mean naive about the entire thing. Uh, but I think a lot of times uh, people wonder, right, why didn't action take place? Because it seems like everyone was in agreement, and then nothing happened. Um, and then again, maybe this is maybe I'm naive. I don't think it's always because of politics. I think that's a lot of times the reason. Uh, but at the end of session, what happened with this bill was um, there's it's competing with a number of other issues: climate change, um, the New York Health Act. Um, uh, I think there was a rent laws uh, that were overhauled. There were maybe funding for the MTA. There's like a ton of different issues that you hear about in the newspaper. Um, all of them are competing against each other for time, funding, attention, uh, all those things. Um, and unless legislators, the media, um, those other entities that are involved here a lot of feedback and a lot of push on any issue, like they did on subway funding, um, they're not going to act because they need to see urgency and pressure. So I, um, I know there's about 10,000 bills in the state legislature at any given time. Wow. About uh, 1,500 get passed. Um, and that was the most productive year <laughs> when that happened. So, uh, and then there's an unknown amount of funding priorities, right? There's, there's a million things that money could be used for uh, that could help people. Um, but how do they make those decisions? Um, and I think sometimes, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, right, it, it, it's like this overt corruption that we're seeing or overt, like, um, political preferences. And that's where the needs go. And that's disheartening. But on the other hand, uh, there is a way to use our agency um, to create and effect, effectuate what we want. Um, I think some of the things uh, that uh, I want to bring up, uh, a couple of examples, um, uh, where um, the rent laws that pass, I don't know if people are that um, familiar. Yeah, uh, this, this, uh, this year, um, there were um, New York, uh, the New York State government um, is, uh, um, had a lot of pressure uh, to pass laws that would protect people who are renting from landlords, give them more protections against eviction, make sure that uh, they, buildings had to be better maintained. Um, and uh, there was a lot of resistance by the leadership um, of, in Albany um, towards bringing these uh, rent laws um, to the table and passing them. Um, I was up there, uh, the campaign on that issue um, was um, confrontational uh, mm -hmm. to the point where people were getting arrested in the Capitol. Um, advocates um, were getting in the face of the governor. Um, and guess what happened? The laws were passed and they got signed. Um, similarly, uh, I know if you all remember uh, Jeff Flake in the elevator during the Kavanaugh hearings. Um, it's another thing where all this pressure led to, again, not the, not exactly uh, what the campaign was intended to do, but 
um, went to, I guess, one individual uh, using his agency in that case uh, to make a statement. Um, I think uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the fight to uh, preserve um, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare um, in Washington, even though there was a, com a government that was completely controlled uh, by a party that wanted to repeal that bill, who had voted in the last, when Barack Obama was president, who had voted dozens of times to repeal that bill. But because they knew that so many individuals were against it and cared about it, they, they couldn't do it, regardless of how powerful they were. Um, so, um, but in this case, you know, those are great examples. In this case, I think it takes a special uh, effort. And again, as I said, uh, the people here uh, can write, the people that y'all are writing for, uh, the people we're here for today, uh, can't write for themselves, uh, they can't speak for themselves. Um, and uh, we're here to use our agency, you know, on their behalf. Um, so, uh, just then, you know, I'd like to, um, you know, it's really uh, great again to see that, you know, there's so many people here on a winter night um, who are willing to, uh, you know, support human rights, even though the left seems impossible. Um, and uh, again, I'd like to thank Ben, uh, Todd, uh, the professors uh, for um, you know their work in organizing this and speaking, um, and again everyone here tonight, you know for uh, for doing this. So yeah, I think I'm done. Well, I think um, I think things are shifting rapidly right now uh, because of the internet. Um, so mm -hmm. I think previously um, people were able to have uh, communications uh, more privately, and I don't think that's a reality anymore. Um, and um, so I think a lot of those uh, personal connections um, are being pushed out uh, because of transparency. Uh, but um, now there's you know people hiring lobbyists um, who used to have um, you know good connections with somebody or you know might have the right phone number at the right time. Um, and um, you know if it's uh, and if if. I guess individuals, if people, um, if voters aren't involved um, and aren't pushing back against something, and the lobbyist is suggesting something, maybe the lobbyist isn't coming from the wrong place. He's trying to help a client. Um, he's hired by a client to push a certain issue through. Um, but if there's no resistance to that issue, they'll get that priority. So it's important to be involved, not to so legislators um, and those in power uh, know that people are watching. Um, and um, I think that's happening more now. Um, but, um, but there are, like candidly, that there are, um, you know, there's, um, there's still a culture uh, that needs more transparency and objectivity. Last question. Um, so when we're talking about individual action, um, we're talking about talking when we're when we're contacting our legislators. What's the most powerful way? What's the most impactful way for us to go about doing it? Is it the letter? Is it by calling? Um, is it calling every day? Is it what does it look like? What's what's the way to do it? Um, I, I think uh, although um, I think uh, frequent communication is a good way to do it um, as much as. Um, I don't think um, hiring a company to send a bunch of robocalls um, <laughs> is the right way to do it, but I do think a personal uh, communication, even if it's one individual um, rather than a hundred, um, you know, if, 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 uh, if you're constantly, if you're a constituent of a legislator, you know, they have to meet with you, like, <laughs> you, you, they're, you're their, you know, they live in their district, they're your representative. Um, so if you're not getting that meeting, just keep following up, um, or if they're not getting attention on that issue, um, you know, I'd use a few different tactics, um, and I don't know whether one is more effective than the other, uh, but I would say be persistent. Do you find, sorry, so do you find social media campaigns to be effective at all? Um, uh, previously, yes, but I think uh, people aren't looking to social media as much anymore because it seems like it's just the loudest voices uh, <laughs> rather than uh, constituents themselves. Um, but that's my take. I yeah. mean, I know there's, and uh, like, um, it depends on individual. I know there's younger people who run their own social media accounts and are speaking 
you know, directly with their constituents, and then there's legislators who don't do that, you know, mm -hmm. because you know, they may have more experience in government, but um, it's not something uh, that they're used to. So it kind of depends on the individual, but I think persistence groups. Thank you. Yeah, so um, the bill was introduced in May. Um, session ended in June. Um, so the way it works in New York is it's actually a two-year session. So the bill will have, it's still in, um, it will have the same bill number as last year, which I will say briefly now in case anyone's interested. <laughs> um, it is A7853S6107. <laughs> we'll put it up on the whiteboard, too. Um, and uh, and um, I know Assemblyman Wapren um, had spoken uh, to the chair of the committee, which that bill is in. Uh, we were hoping it would be in correction, but it wasn't. Um, that, um, that it was assigned to, um, who has indicated that he will review it. Um, he seems favorable to replacing it on an agenda, which is the next step to get it reported. Uh, but yeah, we're hopeful that um, it passes um, uh, next year, early next year. So which starts in January. So if anyone here was interested in going to visit uh, their legislat legislator on an issue, um, could you describe a little bit um, how that would look like? I mean, is it terrifying? Do people that come to <laughs> alive? Or, you know, how well prepared do they need to be? Because um, I think there's not, there potentially might be a, lot, a little apprehension in going to meet someone, you know, that speaks on a political stage. Um, I think, um, um, I mean, I think it depends on the person, on the legislator, I mean, uh, you know, I've seen, I saw like a video of, um, I think, uh, a California senator speaking to some activists like a, a, a few months ago. Um, but I think uh, what's most important um, is to be prepared with um, what you're asking for. Mm -hmm. So. Um, like legislators, they know, you know, as soon as the meeting starts that this is a request. Um, that's what every meeting basically is. <laughs> um, and, um, and, um, and it's most helpful uh, to know exactly what that is, um, especially if you know uh, your interests are aligned um, and they already agree with the justification behind the topic. Uh, their time you know, it's valuable too, because they're dealing with a bunch of issues. Um, so having uh, a specific action that you would like the legislator to take, I think is, is, um, is most helpful and also puts them in a position where, uh, you know, will, will you co-sponsor this bill? Will you introduce this bill? Will you say this publicly on your social media? Um, puts them in a position where they're unable to uh, uh, say, let me look at it further or something like that. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so I want to just, uh, we've, we've gone around a lot of things, but I think we should do it one more time. I want to thank uh, Todd. I want to thank Sumit. I also want to thank our professors who really made this possible. This would literally would not have happened without Professor Scorsio and Professor. Um, so thank you both really a lot for all of you here. Thank you for all of you here. Thank you for all of you So um, that was, to me, you said that you didn't feel like that was such an inspirational way to start, but I feel, honestly, it was extraordinary um, just to see, to hear, hear what the real power of the work is. Um, and, and to hear how we all can sort of affect the change. So, um, so thank you for that, really. Each one of these packets has 10 letters and a sheet of address labels on top of it. Um, so if you feel so inclined as to, to write your own letters for each of our cases, um, please, please do so. As, 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 as Todd said, not used to, not used to uh, that's what um, as I said, the, the power of your own words is really much more than a, a printed letter, but these do have a, they do have impact. Um, so, sign the letters. Um, each letter is written to 
uh, I always had a thing, but um, each letter is written to a person. There's a, um, an ask as part of the letter. At the bottom it has a place for you to sign. Put your name, put your state, your city, state, and zip on the, um, on the letter, fold it up, and everyone should have letters around on the tables to, uh, letter envelopes, sorry, envelopes on the tables to um, put the letters in. Um, letters aren't a big part of our lives anymore. <laughs> So I also have up here, um, how you draw. I know, I know, and I want to be honest, because I know that I barely write any letters, and I'm one of the most people. So, um, so you write your, you put the, put the label here, um, and put your um, return address on the top uh, left-hand corner. You can leave the stamp part, because that will be done by me. Um, so the first, the first part is the, um, the action letters, the direct actions. Second, and... I'm so glad that you spoke about the, the solidarity and how important it is because um, the work we've done on solidarity, the, the solidarity actions we've taken um, when we hear back from people as Todd said, it's just extraordinary. Um, so what we have today, um, our solidarity action for today, there's a 23-year-old um, transgender asylum seeker, her name's Kelly. Uh, she's been locked in immigration prison for the last two years. Uh, she's suffering from medical neglect, has been put in solitary confinement for four months solely because of her gender identity. ICE has the power to release her immediately, but refuses to do so. Right now, Amnesty isn't doing any action on her case, I don't think. But what we can do is send her letters, let her know that we care, let her know that we're here and that we know she exists, and she's important to us because, because she is. She's a person deserving of her human rights. Um, so, to do a solidarity action, we have um, some cards, uh, and the uh, box over there has markers and prints. Make it look nice. Um, the point of the solidarity action is not to make a political statement. It's just to say we're with you. We care about you. We know you're here. Um, we'll go into that a little bit uh, at the end too. Um, feel free to post it on social media about your advocacy actions. If you've taken pictures tonight, please post them on social media. Um, it is important. Um, and then lastly, contact your representatives. If any of these cases matter to you, uh, these 10 cases in front of us here, if any of these cases matter to you, contact your representatives. Say, um, Emil, this person matters to me and I, I care about his case, I care what's happening to him. What can you do? It may be nothing, it may be very little, or it may be that this person has a connection that we don't know about. Then your, your representative wants to, wants to go at that. So um, contact your representatives. Um, and then the last, um, go to write, uh, write.msd.usa.org. There you can see the good news, which is what Todd was talking about, the, the impact that um, this, this campaign has had um, over the last many, many years. So, yeah, so uh, we're going to distribute the letters.